my funky hand position, and the Night Force Beast, this week on Mail Call Mondays. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Welcome to another Monday, and last Monday I posted some footage of the local precision rifle match since I was kind of crunched on time. I uh, just threw up a little bit of, of uh, footage of that, and you guys had some questions about my hand positioning on one of the stages. Uh, we had two uh, precision stages on it where we were shooting on paper and we were really, you had to be very, very precise to get a good score. Uh, one was an egg stage, another was a grouping stage. On both of those, you guys pointed it out and I don't even realize I do it anymore, but I placed my hand differently on the pistol grip on those stages than I did on a lot of the rest of the stages which were more action oriented, more running and gunning, uh, barricades, that kind of stuff. And what that is, well, first of all, let me demonstrate what I was talking about or what you guys had a question about. Now, this is a standard AR pistol grip on here. In this case, this is an Ergo Tactical Deluxe grip. Uh, in the video, I was shooting a Kadex Strike 30 chassis, which has uh, almost exactly the same pistol grip. It just doesn't have the duck bill on it. The actual Kadex chassis makes up for that difference. When you grip these grips normally, people tend to just wrap their fingers around it, meet the thumb on the back side, and then stick their trigger finger in here wherever it ends up going. Uh, that is not a recipe for the best accuracy or the best trigger control, I should say. What we want for the best trigger control is we want to get approximately a 90 degree angle with this trigger finger here. Um, best viewed like that or maybe if I turn like that you guys can see. Uh, we want that 90 degree angle so we can get a straight back press on the trigger. If you're reaching for the trigger like this you'll have a tendency to push it to the side. If you're curled all the way back here you'll have a tendency to pull it the other direction and that will disturb your sight picture. If anything it will apply pressure to the side of the trigger and when the shot breaks it will give the rifle a direction to go. So we want to get that straight back pull and apply pressure directly backwards. We want to get that 90 degree bend in the knuckle to be able to enhance that. Well that is the primary importance. That along with getting the trigger bow right through the center of the pad of the finger. You want to take the distance between your tip and this first joint and you want the trigger bow right in the center of that. To get that what we do is I'll just take my hand in this kind of position here and I will simply place it on the trigger with my hand in an open position. Now I know I've got that exactly where I need to get it. I will bring my fingers back and touch the front of the grip and then I will wrap my thumb around the back of the grip to support that. Now that trigger finger is exactly where it needs to be. It doesn't really matter if I'm wrapped around, if I'm stacked up here. I could even shoot it straight if I really wanted to because these fingers are doing nothing but helping to locate the position of the hand and the position of the trigger finger. So when I really want to take a very precise shot so that I know I'm squared up on the trigger and I have my trigger finger in exactly the position I want no matter which rifle system I'm shooting, I will do that. I'll actually get my trigger finger where I need it to be and I will set my fingers on the front of the grip and hook my thumb around the back of the grip so everything's set up there and very often either I have just very light palm pressure on the side of the grip or I'm floating my palm so it's not even actually touching the grip. That gives me the best razor's edge accuracy. Now it doesn't work really well if I'm in a situation where the rifle is not well supported. If I'm shooting off of a barricade, if I'm shooting over some kind of rest, or if I'm running and gunning, uh, then I will generally grip the pistol grip or the uh, regular stock and really get a firm grip on there. Now I'm not crushing it, I'm not inducing vibrations, and then the trade-off is my trigger finger may not be in an absolutely perfect position. But usually in those kind of situations, the rifle is already unsteady 
to a point, so that trade-off really isn't seen downrange on the impact of the round. It's more important that I'm seating this rifle well into my shoulder and I'm hanging onto it through a recoil than it is to float that hand and get absolute perfect trigger control. And that's the thing I really like about tactical rifle shooting is there are trade-offs in stages. Sometimes you don't have the stability, sometimes you don't have the time, uh, sometimes you don't have really good breathing control because you've had to do something physically exerting afterwards, and you have to find the happy medium between those. So it's you're always borrowing from one to enhance another position. Now let's get to the thing that everybody is looking at right now, and that's this bad boy sitting up here on top of our Ma 10. This is a Night Force Beast 5 to 25 by 56 millimeter F1 rifle scope. Uh, the Beast is actually an abbreviation for best example of advanced scope technology and I had to actually look at my cheat sheet here just because we've been calling it the beast for so long and it is a beast of a scope it's a very large scope and the scope actually comes with a sunshade that would bring it out almost even with the uh, handguard on our Ma 10 here now we've got it mounted up in a night force one piece mount so we've really got it uh, dialed in here we haven't got it out and shot yet, but we've got the uh, eye position, eye relief, and everything set up. And it's a really, really neat setup on the scope. Now, the big thing that catches everybody's eyes is this great big, huge elevation turret. This is what Night Force calls an I4F turret, and it stands for Intelligent Four Function Control Turret. Uh, there are four aspects to the elevation turret. The first one that you'll notice up top here is this is what they call a 360 degree break. At any point during your elevation control, you can lock the elevation uh, where it's at. So right now you can see I can turn the turret freely. If I depress, and rotate the brake, it'll pop up here and you'll see a little red line between there and that tells me the brake's on. It's now very, very difficult. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult to move the turret. It takes a lot of torque to really get it moving. Uh, to turn it off, I simply just push down, rotate, and now we're back to being able to adjust uh, the primary elevation knob. Now another thing that's very different on the Night Force Beast from even other Night Force scopes is that the elevation is in two tenths mil rad clicks. Usually we'll have one tenth mil rad clicks because that gives us a good um, intermediate between precision adjustments and speed, being able to really get to your dope quickly. Well, Night Force wanted to be able to adjust the scope even quicker when you're dialing your dope, so they went to two tenth clicks, and that allows us to get actually 20 mils on one revolution of the knob, and that's massive. Uh, I don't know of any other scopes out there that allow you 20 mils on one turn of the turret. Now, there's a trade-off there, because now you get two tenths of a mil adjustments, on each click, what if you want to go in between there? I mean, two tenths of a mil, that's uh, a little over, that's about seven and a quarter inch at a thousand yards. And seven and a quarter inch is a very coarse adjustment when you're shooting very long range. To supplement that, they put in a elevation fine tune. This is the M2 precision elevation adjustment. And it's just a little toggle switch down here at the bottom of the turret and it really reminds me of the elevation fine tune on the old Unertal 10X Marine Corps scopes. Uh, there you had an up and a down. Here it only gives you one tenth of a mil up. Now I really would have liked to have seen one tenth up and one tenth down but I think they did the one tenth up just for simplicity's sake. That way you always know when you're dialing your dope, say for instance you need to go to 7.5 mills. You're going to dial to 7.4 and then click one tenth mil up. Uh, and when you come back down, you just have to remember to zero that out. So it's really not that big of a deal. The really neat thing about it is if you just want the high speed adjustments, you really don't need that extra one tenth of a mil. Uh, you can forget that lever is there. It's really, it it takes a little bit to move it. Uh, it's not something you're going to do extremely rapidly but it's not gonna flap around on you when you're not paying attention to it. That is the basics on the elevation turret.
one extra feature on here that I really, really like, and the reason you guys keep seeing me look down is I'm referring to the owner's manual here. We've really only had the scope for about a week, so I'm still learning uh, the nomenclature for a lot of the different stuff. Um, they have this nifty little red button here on the windage knob, and this is what they call the window windage zero release. Um, this without pushing the button, if we leave the button alone, the windage is actually locked in place. To get it off of the zero, you have to push the button and then rotate the turret. Now once you've pushed the button and rotated the turret, it is off the zero. Now you can rotate the turret uh, however you like. When you come back, all you do is dial it back to zero and now it locks in. You don't have to manipulate it, just come back and hit your zero and it locks that puppy in. One other thing that they incorporated, is you'll notice, I was only able to dial the windage turret one half turn. You get six mils of windage and then you hit the limiter. Uh, six mils of windage is a ton. Uh, remember, you also have wind holds in the reticle. But what's nice is this prevents you from getting one turn off on your windage. You go to pull this thing out of an Eberly stock pack or out of a scabbard, and you grab these nice aggressive knurls on a standard scope and spin that thing. It's easy to get it one turn off. And when you get it one turn off, then you're going to spend the rest of the match trying to figure out where your rounds are going because you may not even see the splash. It may be that far off. So giving us the windage lock to keep that on zero when it's stowed or when you're moving about and then giving us only a half turn to keep us from getting one rotation off I think is a really nice thing. One other really nice feature on these, what I love to see on rifle scopes is these are marked 1R, 2R, 3R, 1L, 2L, 3L. So they are marked left and right. So when you are on the gun, you can look at your knob and you know which direction to turn it without having to try to crane your neck over and look at the side or see some other kind of marks or an arrow pointing one direction or another. You know, if you need to move the impact of the round one mil to the right, then you just move it to one R. If you need to move it one mil to the left, you move it to one L. Uh, really simple, really easy to remember. Uh, if you shoot a couple of different scopes or you have different setups, then you know you can get kind of confused on that. Uh, this prevents that. Now on the opposite side here, uh, this scope carries Night Forge's Digilume Illumination, uh, which is a digital illumination module. There are no dials to turn. It's not like with the F1 before where you simply had uh, pull on, push off. And if you wanted to change the level, you had to go in with a screwdriver and take the turret apart. Uh, now you just have a button on the side that you hold in to turn the illumination on, tap it to set it where you want it, uh, hold it to turn it off. A uh, really simple, nice setup. Uh, we also have the parallax knob on the left side of the scope. Uh, parallax mo knob moves really smoothly, uh, really feels good. Night Force did not mark any numbers on it, you just have hash marks. Uh, this has always annoyed me quite a bit. I really like to have numbers. I know that parallax settings are different depending upon the magnification, depending upon how you have the ocular uh, adjustment set, but I like to have a guide so if I'm quickly just spinning that knob on instead of having to count lines or count dots or something like that, I know that if I have a 600 yard target I can just whip it to six and then I can do a little fine tune there if I have the time. Uh, not so on this you're stuck with the lines, so you're gonna have to go in with like a paint marker or something later on and mark yardage lines on there if you really want to. Uh, not a big deal, not a make or break it. A lot of scopes are doing that nowadays. Um, I just prefer to actually have real live numbers. Now, when we come back here to the power selector ring, they do still have the whole ocular assembly rotate with the power selector ring. Uh, this is a benefit if you work in adverse conditions. Your hands may be wet, muddy, bloody, etc. Uh, you can just grab the whole ocular and rotate it 
to get the magnification setting you need. You don't have to try to fumble with a small ring here. The drawback to this has always been if you want to use something like Butler Creek flip-up covers, they just really don't work well because you'll end up slamming into one side of the stock, you'll end up limiting your magnification adjustment, or that scope cap's going to end up somewhere where it gets busted off by a bolt knob. Well, Night Force thought ahead on this, and in addition to the regular rubber bikini scope caps that you get with all the Night Force scopes, um, they include a set of beast specific flip up covers manufactured by Tenebrex. Uh, now, these covers, what makes them specific to Night Force is that I can flip the cap up um, and it locks out of the way. It's got a little detent when you flip it back. And if I need to roll my magnification all the way over here to five, I've got a problem here. The cap is hitting against my charging handle, which is not a good thing. If I need to do an immediate action drill or something, I'm gonna rip that cap right off. Well, we've got a hose clamp type collar on here that's tightened by a cross bolt. Once you slide this on and tighten that up, you now have the ability to rotate that cap so that now it's out of the way. I can get back to five. I can still have my cap clocked to 12 o'clock or three o'clock or wherever I want to put it and it's out of the way I can still manipulate the weapon without hitting the cap. Uh, if it's closed it's even easier you just dial it to the power setting you want bring the hinge back up to 12 o'clock and you're good to go. So that's really nice we're gonna see once we get into working with it if it really ends up to be fiddly if so these will come off and we'll go back to the regular rubber bikini cap which I haven't really had any problems with in the past. Uh, don't get fancy with uh, caps if you're worried about it, just go with the bikini caps. But I like the fact that on this level of scope, Night Force has gone to that level of design and they've included them with the scope. Uh, on the front, you also get an objective cap made by Tenebrex, flips up and then pushes down to lock out of the way. Uh, it doesn't just slide on like the regular Butler Creek caps. There's actually a knurled locking ring that you screw into the objective threads and then the cap snaps on to a groove in that knurled locking ring. It's really cool because it allows you to screw the ring in, tighten the ring down, and then again you can clock this cap so that the cap flips open to whichever direction you want. So if you don't want it to flip up in a 12 o'clock position then you can set it to either side. Uh, I will generally set them to flip to the 3 o'clock position when I'm shooting right-handed because I can look down range with my left eye. Uh, if you're in a situation where you need to switch back and forth, then 12 o'clock is kind of better because it doesn't get in the way either direction. And since you can flip them back here, you don't have this great big huge uh, additional black flag flapping around up there. But again, gives you options. Uh, this scope here has a Horus H59 reticle in it. Uh, we wanted to take a look at the Night Force Mill R reticle, but they weren't going to have them ready to ship for a couple more weeks. So we wanted to go ahead and get this out here, get it in our hands, and get some use on it so you guys uh, can hear how well it does or if there are any problems with it. Uh, this is an expensive scope. It runs in the $35 to $3,700 range. So it's not cheap. It's running right up there with Schmidt and Benders. Uh, just taking it out, looking at it in low light conditions, looking at it uh, across the, the neighborhood and here in the city, uh, the glass clarity is very, very clear. I don't have any complaints on the glass clarity right now. Uh, with the 56 millimeter objective, we get a lot of light transmission, so we are not having any problems in intermediate magnifications in low light. The H59 reticle in it combined with the Digilume illumination gives us a lot of options when it comes to low light. I really like the appearance of this package and it's going to take some getting out into the field and shooting it under different conditions to see how well it works. Uh, one thing I didn't comment on is turret feel. Uh, the turret feel is very, very distinct. Uh, it's something that we have come to see from Night Force. Uh, I really like the clicks. You get a tactile and audible um, feel or audible click when they go by. Uh, it really thunks into position as you dial through. And that's something if they went with a 
One tenth mil click, you really wouldn't get. You'd only get 10 mils per rev, which is still a ton if you're shooting anything other than 308. Uh, but you wouldn't get the nice thunks. You get a more of a buzz as they just go by. And what I found with uh, one ten with 10 mil rev and one tenth mil clicks is it's very easy to overshoot your adjustments. Uh, we'll have to get out and actually start dialing under time to see if we have that on this. One other thing I forgot to mention, the i4F Intelligent 4 function control on the elevation, that is the 360 degree brake. It is the primary elevation control on the turret. It is the M2 fine tune lever and a standard zero stop. So there's a zero stop built in as well. Now I can dial past zero right now because we just took this out of the box and the zero stop is not set out of the box. And that's basically so you can get it zeroed without a whole lot of effort. Uh, once you get it zeroed, then you can dial in the zero stop and the turret will not go below zero. Uh, really nice feature. Or what I'll generally do is I will generally set it to be a half mil or a full mil below zero. So if something happens and for some reason I need to dial below zero, I can do so, but I don't get worried about getting lost on a rotation that I didn't want to be on. The windage turret is very easily zeroed according to the instruction booklet, and we'll get in there and show you guys how to do that and play with it during the full review. Uh, this is nothing even close to a full review. I just know I threw some pictures out there. You guys were really excited to see this. So I will walk through it and tell you guys a little bit about the scope. Uh, that's about it for now. I have a lot of learning to do on this optic because it's got a lot of functions. It's really in-depth, and uh, with this price point and this many features, it really deserves a very in-depth view. So here in a couple of weeks, uh, hopefully we'll be able to get back and give you some more information on that. Those of you who've been watching our Facebook page or our Twitter or Instagram feeds know that uh, we've been doing a lot of pistol stuff here lately. And what I've got here is our brand new uh, Gen 4 Glock 17. Um, it really isn't brand new anymore. It's got about 550 rounds through it by now. Uh, I've got one IDPA match under my belt with it and quite a few training sessions and even more dry fire training sessions on it. Uh, but you guys seem pretty interested in this, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, tell you how I have it set up right now and why. Uh, first of all, no magazine in the magazine well. Uh, the handgun is clear, safe direction, so we know it is clear. Now, this Glock is relatively stock. Uh, the Gen 4 G uh, G17 has become my favorite Glock ever. Uh, I fired quite a few different Glocks. Uh, this one just really, I, I have done almost nothing to it, and there is a reason for that. Uh, when I modify handguns, I modify handguns to perform a specific task. If there's a deficiency, then I modify the handgun to prevent the deficiency or to bolster that deficiency. And in this case, really, there was not a whole lot of deficiencies in the handgun. Uh, now we won't get into the 9mm 40 caliber 45 discussion. Uh, I will tell you that I believe that 9mm stoked with the appropriate defensive ammunition is perfectly capable for any defensive or offensive uh, condition that you're going to run into. Uh, it works just fine. Put the bullets where they need to go. The bullets will do what they need to do. Now, Barring the caliber discussion, one great advantage of the Glock 17 is you get 17 rounds in the magazine, one in the pipe. So you have a handgun that you're carrying 18 shots. Um, not a lot of defensive shoots are going to go past 18 shots if you're doing your part, if you're putting rounds into targets and not just spraying and praying. So you're starting off with a handgun that carries enough ammunition to finish just about anything that you're going to encounter, even if you could dream up multiple attacker scenarios. I mean, this allows allow me to put two shots into multiple attackers without having to reload the handgun. So, very good option. Uh, for those of you that are stuck in states with uh, artificially limited magazines, I feel for you because that takes out one of the great advantages of the 9mm and of the Glock 17 to begin with. Now, 9mm, of course, is a really uh, low recoil round, but it still does have some snap 
when you're talking about lighter pistols and it will cause muzzle rise and what really limits the speed with which you can fire the handgun is how quickly the sights return to the target. We're not just blasting, it's aimed fire. The sights actually have to break the target before you can press the trigger again. Otherwise, your shots aren't doing anything but turning money into noise. Well, the Glock 17 helps with the muzzle flip issue by giving you two replaceable back straps that have this neat little beaver tail on them. Um, this is really close to the safety that I have on my 1911. I've got a nice beaver tail safety on that that allows you to really, really get a high grip without worry about your uh, web of your thumb sliding up and getting Glock bit where the slide comes back and slices the top of your hand. But once you get that high grip, when you fire and that muzzle comes up, you've got a lever back here to help stop the grip from sliding down in your hand or to help stop it from sliding around. I really, really like that. That combined with the rough texture frame on the Gen 4 here really locks this handgun into my hand. So it really feels good. Haven't had any need to modify this or put any additional stuff on here. Now, if you've got a smaller hand and you don't have a problem with your uh, web riding up onto the back of the Glock, then you can either run it with no back strap, which will make it smaller than the previous Gen 3 Glocks, or you can run the no duckbill medium or large back strap that it comes with. Uh, now, my hands, I can shoot a Glock 21 just fine, but I still find that the medium back strap is about perfect for me. Uh, it just really feels good uh, when I grab a hold of it and get my hand locked into there. Uh, when we flip it over here, you notice I'm running the stock magazine release. I don't have a need to put any extended magazine release on here. Um, I'm shooting this gun in stock service pistol division, first of all, in IDPA, so I need to keep it as close to stock as possible. When you start loading some accessories on it, it pushes you into enhanced service pistol. But even barring that, I think when Glock opened up this magazine release, it works really well on this handgun. I don't have a problem uh, when I go into reloads to shift the gun on my hand, hit that magazine release, and get it back. It's really easy to hit the mag release, and I'm good to go. Um, you'll notice I have the factory uh, slide lock on here, uh, or slide stop, I'm sorry, uh, factory slide stop on here. I did put one of the extended Glock G G34 uh, slide stops on here, but I decided to go back to the factory version because I am running a very high grip and when I run this very high grip, the ball of my thumb here can engage that and prevent the handgun from locking open. So while the extended uh, slide lock allowed me, or I'm sorry, slide stop, I keep saying slide lock, uh, allowed me to release the slide a whole lot easier, it was a liability because if I, I really don't want this thing to not lock open on an empty magazine. It really hurts you. In a defensive situation, it can cost you your life. Uh, in a competition situation, it can cost you a lot of time on stages to have that click and realize that you don't have a malfunction, you actually need to change your magazine. So that's great. As you can see, even taking a firing grip, I can reach up here and swipe that with my thumb. So it really doesn't need an enhanced uh, part there. And again, only modify to solve problems. The trigger in the Glock, is stock for right now. Uh, one thing I noticed with the Gen 4, once we got some rounds through it and some dry fire through it, it smoothed out really nicely. Uh, the take up is really smooth. You hit that wall and then the break is fairly clean. Uh, the reset is very distinct and really nice on it, but it's heavy. Uh, it is a fairly heavy trigger. So that may cause some issues with accuracy under speed. Uh, so what we're gonna do to remedy that is we contacted uh, Jeff over at glocktriggers.com and he sent over one of the Vogel competition trigger systems for the Glocks. Uh, comes in this nifty little can. For those of you that don't know, uh, Robert Vogel is uh, world champion in IDPA shooting and several other uh, disciplines 
and uh, he endorsed this trigger. It's a trigger that he runs in his guns, and it's a really, really nice setup and offers some uh, pretty slick advantages over the factory trigger. Now, we're not going to get into the discussion on replacing triggers for defensive purposes. That's something you need to sit down and figure out yourself. You need to discuss with a lawyer if you're worried about liability concerns and decide if you want to modify a trigger in a carry gun. Uh, this is for competition purposes, so we'll make sure we get that off of uh, the table right now. I don't want to get into that argument at all. Um, the Glock triggers, Vogel trigger, uh, it replaces pretty much everything. Your trigger housing, your trigger bar, trigger itself, connector, springs, ejector. It's really simple. Instead of trying to polish and modify your system, you just punch your three pins, pop your factory parts out. You can throw them back in the tube if you want. Drop in the Glock triggers parts and you're good to go. If you ever get to a point where you want to return it back to the factory trigger, maybe you're going to sell this gun, you want to put the trigger in another gun, then you can pop it back out and you're good to go. The parts, they look like polished chrome. They are all very highly polished, very smooth, very nice looking. Uh, you get the trigger itself. You get three various striker springs, four, four and a half, and five pound striker springs. And I believe the factory Glock striker spring is about a 5.5 pound. So you can drop that down and you need to match the striker to your ammunition. You make sure you're lighting off your ammunition reliably. If you go too light on the striker, although it lightens up your trigger pull, it may not reliably light your ammo. Uh, you get a firing pin block that is also highly polished, looks like polished chrome, and a lightened firing pin block spring, and you also get two replacement spring cups. So if you launch one while you're replacing your striker spring or mess one up, then you can replace that. And finally, you get an Allen key to adjust the trigger. Reason you need an Allen key is because this trigger has an over-travel adjustment. So whereas with the factory Glock trigger, you got a lot of over-travel there. With the Vogel trigger, you can dial some of that over-travel out so you get a shorter reset and you're not constantly moving that trigger through that distance. So the shorter reset combined with a lighter trigger pull ought to reduce my split times a little bit. Uh, we're going to get this installed here this next week and get it out to the range. It's been raining. Our range has been flooded out here recently. So we'll get out there and we'll do some uh, times and some drills on the timer and see if the Vogel trigger really helps me any. And we'll see what my impressions are on it in the handgun itself. Um, two final pieces that we have on here. Uh, you'll notice that we've got the Surefire X300 Ultra light on here. This is an excellent, excellent weapon light. We've been using it quite a bit. Um, it has a really nice uh, center to the beam and a really nice spill to the outside of it. So uh, you can put that center beam on a target and blind it if need be. Uh, the spill works great for being able to search and identify things without actually pointing your weapon at it. So really nice uh, setup. The switch on it really uh, is, is kind of stiff to my liking. Uh, it's hard to just bump it. You have to push forward if you want to just flash the light. Uh, and that really uh, can run into some issues with pushing your handgun off target if you flash it and then you need to fire. Uh, so if you're running these, I would recommend looking into one of the DG11 uh, tape switches that allows you to put the activation button right here on the grip, and it will activate when you tighten up your grip. Um, we'll be looking into uh, picking up one of those here in the future. But overall, very reliable, very durable light. Uh, one drawback is if you have a holster that is designed to fit the X200, the X300 Ultra may not fit in that holster because it's just a little bit longer up here at the front. Uh, we ran into that on my Safari Land 6004. Uh, this handgun or my Glock 21, when I install the light, has some difficulty fitting into there. It's a really tight fit to get the, uh, the hood snapped back up into position with the handgun in the holster. Uh, anything else works just fine. Also, we have the Trigicon HD sights on here. These are tritium sights. 
I've had Trigicon sights for some time. Uh, they're steel sights, they're really durable. I've smacked them on stuff, banged them around, uh, dropped handguns with the sights on them and never had any problems with them. Haven't even had them shift, so really good, highly durable sights. Uh, what makes the HD sights a little bit different is up front here, you've got this nice orange donut around your tritium vial. Now the tritium still glows green in this model, but the orange donut really draws your eye in the daylight. When you come back here, you've got two tritium dots in the rear sight, but they don't have any enhancements to them. There's no silver rings around them, no white paint, nothing. Uh, so they don't distract your eye when you're shooting in the daylight. You also have this nice deep U-groove notch here, which allows you to pick up that front uh, circle really quickly and get you on target really fast. I really like them. When you're looking at the profile here, you'll notice we've got this really flat, deep notched front. Uh, if you have a situation where you need to rack the handgun one-handed, you can catch that groove on something, a tabletop, duty belt, holster, what have you. And it allows you to rack the slide really quickly and easily. Now, one drawback, and really the only drawback I found to these sights, is when you come back here, the back of the sights are serrated to reduce glare. That's great. Uh, they are canted backwards just slightly, which is also great, but because of the deep U-notch and because of the cant of the back of the sight, you end up with two really sharp points right here on the inside of the sight. On the outside, it's not a big deal. They're nicely rounded, but on the inside, you get two really sharp edges. Uh, I've been carrying this thing for a couple of weeks now, uh, pretty much daily. Uh, while I was doing firearms instruction over the last week, I constantly had it on my side in the holster. And by the end of the week, I had what looked like a bunch of little snake bites just above my elbow here, where the points on the sight would actually pierce me a little bit. And if I wasn't careful, it could actually cut me open. And as you imagine, this is uncomfortable. It's kind of a mess when you're bleeding all over everything. And then lastly, uh, if you wear a cover garment over these, it can catch on your cover garment, but also can really tear up the inside of a suit coat, uh, inside your shirts, whatever. So that's something that I think Trigicom really needs to address with these. Now, we addressed it very simply by grabbing a half round jeweler's file and knock the points off, and then I grabbed some cold blue and cold blued them back up so I don't have any problems with any uh, shine coming off the edges. And that worked great, no problems with it now at all. Now the dot up here is so bright on these that I don't know that I would gain any advantage by running fiber optic sights on this instead of the tritium sights. The fiber optic sights will be a little bit cheaper for you, but I don't think they're gonna be as durable as these Trigicons. And if you've got a handgun that you're gonna use dual purpose for competition and for carry, for home defense, etc then I definitely recommend Trigic or, uh, Tritium sights, rather they're Trigicon, Ameriglow, et cetera, over fiber optic sights, because the Tritium will work in absolute darkness. Uh, without the trigger modifications that we talked about, I'm gonna tell you this is an excellent, excellent home defense gun. I've talked to you guys before about my preference for handguns over rifle or shotgun as a home defense gun mainly because I have small kids, I have a house with a lot of doors, and I have two dogs. So I have a lot of reasons why I would want to be able to let go of my firearm and use my support hand to manipulate something, but be able to retain and engage with my firearm if need be. I can shoot a shotgun one-handed, I can shoot a carbine one-handed, I train with injury drills on both to be able to manipulate them no matter what the situation, but I am far faster and more accurate with a handgun one-handed than either of those other two. So this is my preference for home defense type situations and I, I can give you a two thumbs up for a rig like this with a weapon light and Trigicon sights for a home defense gun. Great, uh, easy for women, smaller stature shooters to manipulate. Uh, I have my 12 year old son shooting this thing out at the range this weekend. So even younger shooters are gonna be able to run it just fine. Well, and that's all we have for Mail Call Mondays this week. I hope you guys have enjoyed the show. And if you have, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe. If you got any comments, leave them in the comment section below or send them to us on Facebook or Twitter. 
And until next time, get out and shoot.